very nice to see this many people standing in front of me. Of course, we're talking about the painting uh, in its physical state. It's uh, on plywood. It was found out in the street somewhere. And when I lived in art space, it was a lot of traveling about finding raw materials just up and down Main Street, a lot of packing crates and so forth. So I had a piece of muslin left over from some theater work and I glued that on. And uh, you can see if you get close that it's got different textural complications, I guess you could say. There's uh, collage pieces from other paintings. Acrylic uh, collage that's been glued on top of the muslin and then ripped off again. So there's an underlayment to it. And it, it kind of has a, a quality of uh, textile, I guess, ultimately, because that's what muslin is. And it, I like the idea that you can glue what is linen paper, very, very finely woven paper, uh, straight down, and then you would put a great deal of weight on it, and it just adheres. And, uh, I've had trouble with the bubbles, and I've had trouble with uh, all kinds of issues of, of adhesion, but sometimes that's good, because then it starts to peel off, and you say, well, what happens if I peel that off? You know? and some are intended to be uh, referencing landscape, uh, others are atmospheric. So there's a balance in all kinds of ways of this uh, composition coming together. Uh, it's one found wood frame and you know, put on hanging device. It's heavy because of all the wood. It was supposed to be in a show at the JCC Delaware. There were many paintings there, uh, eight paintings in all. And there wasn't a room for this one. So this one didn't make the cut, you know, so to speak. Not because you know, I didn't like it enough. It was just there wasn't room for it. So it's here. And I have not often participated in Paul Wall shows, certainly not when I was writing. I thought I ought to be a lone wolf, you know, no associations with groups or uh, issues like that. And it's taken me a long time to imagine myself uh, as part of an artist's community, because as a writer, you feel like you want to uh, stand outside it, not above it, but just uh, uh, on the periphery, able to keep everybody involved that uh, comes across your line of sight. The title, Iceburn, I don't know. I came up with it because there's little flashes of orange maybe breaking through, and there's been a great deal of natural disasters to deal with and will continue to deal with as we move toward this serial of extinction that everybody is pretty sure we're moving toward. So ice burn is, it sounds like a oxymoron, but there's actually uh, some background to it. If you look at it metaphorically, ice uh, is the frozen self and burn would be the passionate opposite. Together they form this kind of uh, back and forth push-pull. The notion that uh, maybe the, the glaciers are burning up from the uh, increased uh, greenhouse gas and the loss of ozone. And at the same time, uh, forests are losing soil and so they're drying out and they have nothing to replace them. And then they, uh, Hot weather comes and it's all tender for forest fires. So land management is not what it used to be. And we get tremendous forest fires uh, in what they're calling the fire season, which is almost all year round now in some states. So ice burn references that, but it's also a, a slang term for insult. And if you go to the online slang dictionaries that will say a burn is an insult that really does affect uh, one personally. So it's so extreme in the insult of it that it's uh, agonizing and uh, appalling 
and this, this situation with extinction is. So when you've got a, an insult that was called a, a burn, you just would kind of cringe and snap your fingers and say, oh, burn, man. Oh. You know. So it was that effect. And that's the way I felt about it once I realized that it wasn't just an oxymoronic context. It was actually something I'm getting really appalled about, generally speaking. And the paintings I used to make, well, they were about houses and trees and houses through trees and water inserting itself into forests and forests just being flooded and uh, waveforms. All these classical kinds of constructs that you can put on a landscape. And now it, the whiteness has become glaciers and uh, frozen situations. And many of the paintings uh, evolve out of that kind of concern, like where's the glacier in the painting? <laughs> or where is uh, this environmental uh, assault? So as things develop, I've become this kind of Anthropocene artist who's concerned with the human condition and the expedient bargains that have been made to sustain it. That's all. What do you have to do to bring the painting to a point where it's really something of itself? And a painting it has its own self quality. It, it, it doesn't have a a system like a railroad train or a, you know, an aircraft or a hand tool. Or, but it does have a sense of, of the selfness of it if a human being is involved in its faction, as I am. So I don't have anything set up except maybe a fondness for a blue. <laughs> but, Blue only goes so far. You've got to translate it, like I say, into atmosphere, mass, and volume, scale. And you have to be able to see into the paint. Uh, a lot of the time I spritz it, so it grids down. By turning it 90 degrees, it grids over. 90 degrees, it grids back. Sometimes that holds, sometimes it doesn't. This actually, to me, because I'm kind of literal about it, it looks like something emerging from the center of the painting. I'm not sure what might, might be kind of an organic form. And it's as if it's sort of parsing the blue surrounds. It might be a nose, it might be a penis, it might be the, an elbow. It, it looks like some kind of organic form is, is kind of emanating from the center. So that's my literal thing. I don't want to think about it that much. <laughs> so. I put it back in the, the gauze of its uh, the, whatever visibility it provides to the viewer. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, it's great to see all these happy, smiling faces on this day. Thanks very much, John.